All right, uh, let's get started. Um, hope you had a good Valentine's Day and didn't drown yourself in dark chocolate like I did. Um, uh, do you guys have any questions? So who's looked at the midterm one sample and has questions about it? Are there any questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, I'm sorry? The median. the median, yeah, what about it? Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, on a, so the question is about the median on assignment three. Let's actually download this, see if it can open PDF. So the median is uh, the middle two values. Uh, so it's the average of the middle two values, right? So, um, uh, so the hint is actually very helpful here. Can you? So, um, is the user necessarily going to enter these four values in ascending order like this? It, it could be any order, right? Could we? I don't recommend doing this, but could we just brute force all possible ways of the values being ordered? Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, but do you think that's what I'm trying to get you to do? Yeah. No. So the hint is really helpful here. So, so the median, look at, so look at the median right here. Which values does it consider? <coughs> B and C. Does it consider the minimum or the maximum? No. no. So let's see. Uh, here's another thing that might help you. Do I need to know the values of B and C? in order to compute the median? Or do I just need to know B plus C? I only need to know B plus C. I don't need to know necessarily what B is and what C is. OK, so let's see. Suppose I know what the minimum and maximum are of the four inputted values. How do I get the middle two out? I ignore the divide by two, just the, the B plus C. How do I get that? Yeah, but so I get rid of the minimum and maximum, but from what? Well, let's see. What if I added all four values up? So I just add A plus B plus C plus D. Then what if I then took away the minimum and took away the maximum? What am I left with? B plus C. Does B plus C help me find the median? Yeah, it helps us quite a bit. So that's why I ask you, can you find the minimum and maximum with a few if statements? And we've done that before in class. So hopefully that can help. Yeah? So I think the, the maximum, how you showed us uh, for question one of the midterm, and it, for mine, it keeps outputting the max is equal to A, even if I put bigger numbers than C or it, it may be that you're having incorrect logic. So what? So how do you compute the maximum? Set the maximum equal to the first value that was entered. If B is larger, set it to set the maximum now to be B. If the if the third value that was entered is larger than the maximum that we saw, either if it was updated or not, then update it to be C. So update max to be the C value if it if C is larger. And then finally, if the fourth value is larger, then update max accordingly. So you may be updating the wrong value. So would it, would it be two equal signs or one equal sign when you say like max is A and then B is greater than max and then you know, B is equal to A and then max is so, one equal sign? It, so is it one equal sign or two for assignment? One. Okay, so if you're doing two, then what is that doing? Checking equality. So is that actually updating the value, checking equality? No. So you need one equal sign. <laughs> okay, uh, you may be updating the wrong value, or your so the condition should be on max the the va the variable max you make, not the original variable like a or something. Other questions. Okay, so. Uh, Last time, and I guess time before, uh, 
we were talking about these things called functions. So what's a function in general? Smaller parts of a bigger program. Right. So it's, yeah, it's just a little piece that accomplishes some task of a bigger program. So we've seen this before where we have modular programming, which is breaking up a, pro uh, a program into smaller parts. And a function is just a piece of that. Uh, so it's a module of modular programming. It's the same thing. So we started talking about functions and how to actually make a function in C++ before. So uh, if we call a function, that's just invoke, putting the name of the function with parentheses and then any parameters for that function. And then the function itself has, if we want to define a function, we have to have the name of the function, obviously we got to have some parameters to it depending on what we're trying to build a function for. The body of the function is just the stuff, the work inside the function. And what is the, what is the type of thing that's going to be given back? So are we returning an integer? Or are we returning a float value or a string or whatever? So it, or the return type tells us uh, what thing you should expect if you call this function. So in, this ex so in the example of main, um, the name of the function is main. There's no parameters here because there's nothing uh, between the parentheses. Um, but in principle, any function can have any set of parameters. But this one just ha happens to have nothing. Uh, the body is the stuff between the curly braces. And the return type is the thing that goes before the name of the function. So it's int in this case. But we could make a function uh, of a different name with a different return type, different parameters, anything we want, pretty much. We, so the thing that we will be talking about quite a bit is something called a function header. So a header is just everything minus the body. So, so if you just strip away all of the code inside the function and the curly braces, you're left with a header. So it's the return type, then the name of the thing, and then the parameter list. That's all it is. Uh, and with no semicolon. So we also talked about some re different return types. So main, for example, has a return value of int. Um, we could make a function that returns a double or a string or whatever. But sometimes there's no need to actually give back a value. So if we have a function like print heading, that doesn't do anything other than just print stuff. It doesn't give anything back to the user, uh, it, uh, to whoever called this function, really. Um, so all it's doing is printing. Then uh, we put the, we got to put something here, and the thing we put there is void. So void just means uh, there's nothing that is returned from this function. So uh, I can't say print heading and assign it to some variable because it's not giving a value back. Uh, so that's when we would want to use void. So in that case, what we would do is just say print heading on its own line if we're trying to call the function. We're not trying to assign to anything in that case. So if you want to call a function, this is how you would do it. So uh, you would call the function name with parentheses, and then you put inside the parentheses any parameters that are needed to pass to the function. So in this example of print heading, how many parameters are here? Zero. So any invocation of print heading in any other function has to have no parameters to it. OK? So in this, in this case, uh, I'm not passing any parameters to it. And then, so when we're calling the function and then we eventually get to that line, we jump from where that function call is to the function itself, start executing in the function, and whenever it's done, we come back to where we just left off before we called it. Uh, we don't have an example. Okay, so we'll, we'll do an example of that. Um, uh, after the function is done, uh, execution resumes, from where that function was called. So if it was called on line 42 of main, we call this function print heading, it does its thing, then we come back, we resume from line 42, and then keep going as necessary. 
Um, yeah, so that's that one. Main is automatically called when the program starts, so it must start at the top of main. And of course, it can call any, any number of functions as necessary. Gravity is evil, I know. <laughs> um, yeah, main can call any number of functions, and functions can call other functions. So let's actually do an example of this. So I have uh, lined up a short example here. So suppose that uh, we want to know the volume of a sphere. Okay, so we want the user to input the radius to the program, and we want to compute the uh, volume of the sphere. And I gave you, oops, it's not quite correct. It's, uh, the volume of a sphere is, I'm just giving it to you here, which is 4 thirds pi r cubed. So the uh, 4 thirds times pi times radius cubed. So I'm actually going to make a slight change here. And I want you to tell me, should I have a return type of int here? No, why not? Well, why do we want to return a double, though? Yeah, because we're using pi, and as far as I know, pi is irrational. And so there's no way we're going to actually get an integer. Could I say integer, though? Yeah. It, it, it wouldn't do what we want it to do, right? It will do truncating, which may be okay in some cases, but in this case, I don't think we should truncate. So that's why I think double is a better return type here. What if I change these to int? Could that be okay? It could be okay, but in general, I think the user should be allowed to put any value that they want. So instead of just saying it has to be four units is the radius, or five units, or six units, they can enter four and a half units, or any non-decimal val or non-integer value that they want. So I think a better parameter type here is double, because uh, that gives the user more flexibility. But um, let's just say that we had a different function that... Uh, Let's see, what would be an example? Suppose that we wanted to return the square of an, uh, square of an integer. So let's just say we wanted to have a function called square, and it takes an uh, integer x. And we want to return x squared. And let's just assume for whatever purpose that we only care about integers here. We don't care about any uh, decimal value. Is it OK if I put double here? Is it okay? Yeah, that's perfectly fine. So an integer squared is an integer, but every integer can be represented by a double anyway. So I'm not worried about, so there's no, nothing really wrong in doing this. But what might confuse anyone who wants to use this function if I put double here? They may think, okay, well, they could give me any double, right? Because it says, I'm going to be giving you a double. Could any double potentially be returned there? If I just put double here? Yeah, I could just, for example, ignore that parameter. I don't have to use x if I don't want to. And so uh, this is not very useful for the user because then they have to do some additional work maybe to figure out, OK, they could be giving me any double, but I only want an integer. So I need to do some truncation, maybe, or do some other calculation, which may not be necessary. So to communicate this more effectively, we should put int. Because now, uh, in principle, I can be giving any integer, but the user now knows we can't be giving anything but an integer. And so they understand what is going to be given to them. Does that make sense? So the return type and the parameter types are very important. OK, so let's actually figure out how to actually do this. So I made two functions right here. You could do this without any other functions than main or one or two. I'm just showcasing an example of this. So let's see. Uh, I have this cube value function up here. So uh, and it says here, we're going to return the value cubed. 
So what's one way I can do this pretty easily? Just that one piece, just the cube value uh, function. It just returns the parameter cubed. That's it. Yeah, yeah. So I just return the value, the thing that was passed in here. So if value was 5, then we want to return 125. And the way we do that is value times value times value. So here it's returning the whatever was passed in cubed. So if I enter negative 1, it'll give back negative 1. So that's the only purpose of this function. So when you're making functions like this, try to make it so that each one does exactly one task. It's not doing a whole load of tasks all at once. So cube value, its entire purpose is to cube the whatever was passed in. So why would this function actually be useful for computing the volume of a sphere? I can call that function. Do I have to? No, I could just leave this function there and not use it if I wanted to. But if I'm smart, I would actually use that function here. So we're composing functions together. So this function will actually be useful in the volume of sphere function. So how would I actually compute the volume of a sphere this way then? We, well, we can actually just return it here. I could save it to a variable if I want to then return it, or I can just return it all in one statement. So what if I just wrote four thirds like this? Ah, it's integer division. What would four thirds give me, like, written like this? Yeah, it'll give us one. And that's probably not what we want. So what's an easy fix to do? 4.0 4 is a, a good way to go, or 3.0, or something like that. Times, so I'm going to be lazy and not import the right header for this. Should you import the right header and actually figure out the right value of pi? Yeah. So I'm just going to be lazy and say 3.14. So pi equals 3.14. Uh, good question. So what if we did this? It's actually a very deep topic in C++. We can't know for sure what will happen first. So on the hierarchy of what, uh, whether the multiplication or division is done first, we don't know for sure. Because uh, they are at the same level of hierarchy. And C++ has this rule that says, um, in general, the order of evaluation is unspecified. So, Pretty much every compiler you'll ever, ever uh, encounter will do left to right, but there's no explicit rule to say it has to be done left to right. So uh, pretty much uh, any time, uh, if you do 4.0 divided by 3, because there's no other addition there, there's no problem in doing that. Um, sometimes what I do is I do 1.0 times it, and it's because it's always left to right, this is not a problem. But in general, you might uh, encounter an issue. Uh, but this won't encounter an issue. So, okay, so let's just say that I, uh, okay, maybe I'm a little more precise. Uh, and pi is absolutely equal to 3.14159 and no other digits. Um, okay, well, what else do I need to do to complete the puzzle? Yeah, so what if I just did, would this work fine? Yeah, is it a good idea? Not because we use the other function. Well, what if, so geometry is not going to change on us for as far as I know. But let's just say that what, for whatever reason, the volume changed to radius to the fourth power instead of three. How many places do I have to change it now? Two, two places. So if some other place I'm using cube value, then I need to change it here and over there. But we may not want to actually do that. So what we'll do instead is let's call the function cube value and pass the radius along. So if, we're, if radius is 5, for example, 
then what will happen is we'll compute 4 thirds times pi times now we'll jump execution into the cube value function, compute 5 cubed, which is 125, give back 125 uh, right here, and then continue executing the volume of sphere function. So let's actually see if this actually works. So let's just say we enter 5, and if we do 4 thirds times uh, the exact value of pi, obviously, then we get exactly the right value. Well, minus a little bit. Um, okay, so the point of this example is that we can have functions call other functions. Okay? Suppose I did this now. So I'm going to cut the volume of sphere function and then just paste it up here. Before I try to compile, what do you think is going to happen? All I did was move the function up above the cube value function. So someone may, says no difference. Anyone have a different opinion? Ah, so let's see. Use of undeclared identifier cube value. We defined cube value right here, but it says it's not, uh, it's not declared. Ah, so think of scope now. Remember what scope is for variables. It's from wherever it was declared down. Same thing for functions. So if we have a function uh, that's declared before the other one, and the top one calls the bottom one, then that's out of order. Okay? That's why the original order that I had where all the calls went up the file. So before what we had was main calls volume of sphere and volume of sphere calls cube value, which is on top. That was okay. Whereas if I put it the other way, it doesn't work. But let's just say for whatever reason, uh, we have cube value calling volume of sphere with the value. Somewhere in here. Maybe we're doing a C out statement or something. Let's see. Volume of sphere is calling cube value, and cube value is calling volume of sphere. No matter which way I put the functions, they're out of order. So how do we fix that? It turns out it's not possible with the things that we know so far. However, we can do it, great segue, to something called a prototype. Because of this uh, weird order where no matter how I lay out the functions, there's something that's going to go wrong. Um, we have a way of dealing with that, which, which is something called a prototype. So the compiler must know everything about a function before it can actually use it, as well as uh, if it can be called at all. So it needs to know uh, the name of the function, obviously. It needs to know the return type to figure out, okay, are you doing uh, good things with the return type? Are you trying to assign doubles to ints or to strings or doing bad things? Um, are the number of parameters the same? So if I had, I'm trying to call cube value with two parameters, that shouldn't be allowed because cube value only has one parameter. So it, it needs to know that information. So if there's a mix match, then it should throw an error. Um, but also the data type of each parameter. So if I, for whatever reason, said, uh, screw this, I'm going to do uh, 5 right here as a string, this won't actually compile because uh, the header of cube, of, sorry, a volume of sphere says you must be passing a double into here. Whereas you're trying to pass in a string, and those aren't compatible with each other. And so it'll actually throw an error if I try to do that. So it says uh, no, not, well, it doesn't say it explicitly. It says no matching function for call to this. Because we're saying 
volume of sphere, we're trying to pass a string in, but the compiler doesn't see a volume of sphere function with a string parameter, only with a double parameter. And so that's, um, the compiler needs to know all that information. So how does prototypes uh, play into this? So prototypes are a way of declaring a function before its definition, okay? So a prototype allows you to say, I'm gonna declare this function, but not right here. So there's a function that's going to be declared, it's not right here, it's sometime later. So why is that useful in our situation? Let's turn this back. So let's say we had our original situation where we put the things in the wrong order. Then what we can do instead is, let's copy and paste the, just the header part of each function. Oops. Uh, copy both of them. So the headers are upstairs right here. And now we're going to put semicolons here. So the, the semicolon with the header says, this is a prototype. So it's saying a volume of sphere function that returns a double and takes a double as a parameter, that's going to be defined somewhere else. I'm declaring it right now, but it's defined somewhere else. If you're trying to call it and you're looking at the prototype, it's going to be uh, defined somewhere, but it's not right here. So how does this work from the compiler's perspective? So if we left these out, then we return to our original problem where Q value, it says, I can't find this function. But if we put the prototypes back in, it says it's going to be looking up, looking for a Q value function. Then it eventually finds the prototype up here and says, ah, it's, de it's declared right here, but it's not defined. So the compiler does something called a two-way pass over the file. So what happens, the first pass, you're not going to be tested on this. It's just for your information. The first pass looks and says, okay, uh, where are, are there any functions that are just declared and nothing else? So I don't care about the definition, which is right here. I only care about the definition, just looking at is this uh, function declared here, maybe not defined. So, uh, so the compiler on the first pass sees, okay, these two functions are here. The second pass, it looks through and it says, ah, this volume of sphere function is right on line seven. So anyone looking for the volume of sphere function will have to go to line seven. Anyone looking for the Q value function has to go down to line 12. So when we come to here in the execution part and we see, ah, oh, there's a Q value function, it looks up and it eventually says, oh, there's the declaration way upstairs and it says, ah, it's defined on line 12. So then it jumps down to line 12. So uh, this is a way of saying, the function exists, but it's not right here. It's going to be defined later. So we don't have this issue anymore of some function calling another one before the other one. And so there could be, uh, there could have been an issue, but this avoids the issue altogether. So just to recap, the header is everything but the body of the function. So without the curly braces and the stuff on the inside, and the prototype is the same thing, but with a semicolon at the end. That's the only difference. Uh, so, and you uh, typically put prototypes at the top because if you need to resolve some issue about something calling another function, then uh, you're never wrong by putting it at the top where there could be no collisions. So just put them at the top, which is what this says. Um, a program must include either a prototype, so the, that single line, or the full function definition before any call to it. Uh, because the compiler error occurs because it's looking up, it can't find it, and so it says, ah, I can't find it. Uh, when using these, the definitions can be placed in any order. 
uh, traditionally main is placed first. This is not true anymore because the main function, uh, no, no function is going to be calling main. So main is going to be calling other functions. So the main function should be placed at the top or the bottom. Which one? If, if it's going to be calling other functions. The bottom, because it's going to be looking up through the file, looking for any functions it needs to call. So if we put it at the top, it's not going to find any. So that's why it's typically placed at the bottom. <coughs> Traditionally, it might have been placed first, but more recently it's placed at the bottom. Okay. Uh, any questions about prototypes in general? Yeah. So, uh, so the question is, um, is this the reason why C++ is called object-oriented? I don't think so, because we haven't gotten to objects yet. So an object uh, has different rules about where functions can actually go. Uh, short answer is free-for-all. But um, so we, we haven't gotten to objects yet, so there's, uh, yeah, it doesn't have anything to do with objects yet. There's a question back, I think. Yeah. That's a great analogy. So uh, as was suggested, prototypes are like table of contents. The, the chapters are declared here. So there's going to be a chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, whatever. And then it's not placed right there. It's going to the actual text of the, of the chapters placed later. And so if you're looking for a particular chapter, you zoom either through the book uh, going down through the pages until you either find it or you find the table of contents and you look, oh, okay, I should have looked on that page. So it's the exact same idea here. Yeah? What if you define a function inside of another function? Great question. You can't do that. So uh, the question is, well, can you define a function inside of another one? So let's actually try. Oops, let's do it the other way. It'll probably turn out, oh, you can do this, but uh, I'm very sure you can't. Yeah, so function definition is not allowed here. So uh, you can't have a function inside of another function, unfortunately. In Python, you can, but in C++, you can't. So uh, yeah, so that would actually would resolve this issue of like functions before other ones. Um, Partly, actually. But um, yeah, you can't do this. So you need prototypes in some cases. Yeah? For the parameter of volume zero, could you change the radius to the value? Yeah, uh, that's actually a fantastic question. So um, this radius right here, you may be wondering okay, you call it radius here. Does it have to be the same variable name as was in main? Well, Let's try. Let's put a different value here. Or let's see. Ah, it works. So in fact, this name right here is for your purpose. You can use it any way you want. Um, but obviously, if someone's going to be using your function, you want a, a better name than Ryan for this. Um, yeah, so it doesn't have to match the name here. So, but it, it leads to something even deeper. So what actually happens when we call this function? So let's just say we enter five. So the radius from main over here has the value five because the user entered it. So when we call this function, you may be thinking, okay, well, this, if we left it back at radius over here, oops. Okay, never mind. So this radius right here is actually a different piece of memory. So even though they're called the same thing, they're different values. So if I modify this radius right here uh, in the parameter, it doesn't affect the one back in main. So they're completely independent. So in fact, I can actually, even if they were the same, I could... Uh, rename them any way I want. But radius is a good name for this because 
uh, the thing that's going to be passed in is a radius, and so therefore we're all set. And then, like in a month, maybe a month and a half, we're going to talk about uh, how do you modify the original value? Because there are two separate locations in this case. But we'll get to that eventually, I promise. Any other questions on prototypes? OK. So uh, let's talk about the arguments or the parameters of functions. So if we're, like in our example, we passed radius into the volume function. So you may be thinking, OK, well, what can I actually pass into a function? So you can pass in pretty much anything as long as it evaluates to the right type. So the volume function says, I'm expecting a double to be entered at some point. So uh, as long as we're passing in a double, we're OK, or something that um, evaluates to a double. So if we have like a times a plus b times b, then if that evaluates to a double or whatever square root uh, needs, then we're all set. So you can uh, have a function call in here if you want. You can have a very complex expression if you want. You can do pretty much anything in here as long as it evaluates to the right type. So if a function was expecting a string, we need to be passing in a string. If it's expecting an int, we should be passing in something that evaluates to an int. Uh, the values that are passed in are the arguments to the functions. Parameters, arguments, pretty much inter interchangeable here. Um, there are some alternate names, but they aren't really that important. Uh, I've actually never heard anyone say actual argument or formal argument, but uh, some people might. Just think of them as arguments or parameters. They're pretty much the same thing. So uh, in the argument itself, uh, so, bo so are both of these prototypes the two examples right here? Well, <laughs> this one says prototype, but what about the first one? Well, let's see. Does it have all the pieces minus the body? Does it have a function name? Does it have a parameter list? Yes. So in this case, for parameter, sorry, for prototypes, you do not have to say the name of the variable. So uh, like in the second example right here, we have num, which is the name of the variable. For prototypes, you don't need it because all you all you really need to know is what types are needed. So this even or odd function is just expecting an integer. For the actual definition of even or odd, when you actually write the code, the body for it, you do need the name for it. So only in the prototype can you just omit this. Um, you, you can include it if you want, but uh, it's it's not really needed for a prototype because the code's not there. Um, let's see. Yeah, so the, the header, when you actually make the function itself with the body, needs the name for it. And then if you just want to call the function, it's the same thing as we've done before. Even or odd with parentheses, and you pass in whatever value you actually want to pass in. Oh, and another thing. So you don't say here... Uh, you don't pass the type as well. Back it up a little. So you don't pass the type here. So some students actually make this mistake sometimes. Um, you only pass in the either variable or the value that you want to work with. You don't need the type to pass in as well. Yeah. Yeah, uh, good question. So can I actually declare the variable here? And the answer is no. So, so yeah, you can't actually declare a variable right here. You have to declare it before you uh, pass it in. Yes. Uh, other questions? Okay, so no data type argument. Yeah, so you don't pass in the data type, uh, as I just said. Um, let's see. So this first bullet point is true for now. It, it won't be true when we get to more advanced stuff. But for right now, when you pass in some value, it's copied to a new location. And then you're now working with an independent copy of the original one. 
And we saw an issue with this last time. Uh, so yeah, so it's copied. A function can have any number of parameters at once. So it can have 0, 1, 2, or as many as you want. Uh, yeah, there must be a data type listed uh, in the prototype, as we have seen, and uh, an argument declaration. So for each of the parameters of a function, you need the type for it. So if you have a function that takes an int, a double, and then a string, you need an int some name, double some name, and string some name. You need a type for each one of them. Um, yeah, and, and this one is kind of annoying sometimes. If you are expecting an integer for a function, but you pass in a double, then the truncation will still occur. Just like uh, if you're assigning a double to an integer, it does truncation. Same idea here because you're making a new memory location based off of what was passed in. Okay, so if you have multiple arguments, so let's just say we have uh, a, a height and a weight. So I'm not sure why that's not width, but it's height and weight in this case. So in this case, we are having two parameters. So we have a height and a weight that's being passed in. And the way that you separate them is with a comma. So in the header as well as the prototype, you have the each variable separated by a comma. And then if we wanted more parameters, we put more commas with more parameters as, as needed. Okay, any questions on multiple arguments or anything else before that? Yeah. Good question. So yes. So the question is, um, can I make one of them an integer and one of them a string uh, or a double? Yes, you can. So you can do something like this. And uh, I can have this in any combination I want. So I can have double then int or int then double. The order actually matters here. So uh, you need to have your the, the function be reasonable to understand the order. So the height and weight, I think, should they, should they either of them be integers for height and weight? Probably not because height and, uh, and weight are continuous values. So it's not discrete like uh, 100 pounds, 101 pounds, 102. You can have fractional values too. So in this case, I think it's best if both of them are doubles. But maybe for height, uh, you always round to the nearest integer or centimeter if you're more civilized. So uh, it depends on your actual use case. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so this was a, a question that was asked before. You can't declare a variable when you're calling a function like this. Yeah. So you have a function that's like returns an int or a double, and then it returns two. How will you separate? Does it return one? Oh, good question. So um, we're going to get to that. Other questions, though? So the question that was asked was uh, something to do with return, so let's understand what return does. So in any function at all, if you encounter a, a return statement, the execution of the function is done. So wherever it is in the function, doesn't matter where, if you encounter a return statement, it just stops the function entirely right then and there. So that's why for the main function, when we encounter return zero or return whatever, the program stops. Because the main function is the thing that started the program. So if the function of main stops, then there's nothing left to execute. So that's why the return zero stops the program in the main function. What if I put a return zero in some other function, not main? Does it stop the program? No. So, so in all cases, it always stops the function execution. But it's just in main, there's no other function to execute when it's done. So that's why the program stops. But in all cases, it always stops the function. But you can place it anywhere you want. So th there's, no, uh, no, there's no wrong place to put a return statement. You can put it anywhere. Um, 
It can be used to prevent abnormal termination of program. Uh, we'll see an example of that later. Uh, without a return statement, uh, you could have a function without any returns at all. What will happen is when it encounters the last curly brace of the function, it stops the function right there. So if we had, if we looked at this example right here, you notice this display data function has no return in it. And so what happens is it just zooms through the function and stops when it reaches the last curly brace. So you don't actually have to have a return value or a return statement, but most of the time you do. Um, so this is kind of interesting. The vast majority of the time, you use it with returning a value. So like in our cube example, we're returning uh, 4 thirds pi r cubed. So we're returning an expression, either a value itself or something that evaluates to a value. So like 4 thirds pi r cubed, that's an expression. So the question that was asked is, can we return multiple variable or multiple values at the same time? In C++, there's no way. So in C++, there's no way to return multiple values at once. You can only return one value. Now, there are ways of binding values together into one structure, and, and we'll see that in the next chapter, I think. Um, in Python, so I keep bringing up Python, in Python you can, you can return multiple values, but not in C++. So it has to be one single entity that is returned. Um, yeah, so expression should be of the same data type. So if the function says we're returning a double, you should return a double. So just to match the function uh, definition. Yeah, uh, the return statement can be used to return a value from a function that made the function call. So in the volume example, we returned a specific value, the volume of the sphere. Um, the prototype and function header must be identical in terms of what the return type is, what the name of the function is, and what the parameters are. They need to sync up to each other. Um, now, do we have to use the, the thing that was passed in or, or the thing that was returned? No. So in fact, I can throw this value away if I wanted to. I can just do this. I could say, I'm not going to use this value anywhere, right? So I'm just going to compute this, not assign it to anything, and just throw it on the floor. Could I do this? Yeah. yeah. Is it useful? No. Probably not. Sometimes it is. So like if we had a void function that didn't give a value back, would I be assigning it to anything? No, because it's not giving us a value back. So for void functions, you do something like this. In some cases, if you are, so sometimes in my research, um, I want to actually compute something, but I don't want to actually uh, know what the value was. I just want to compute it. And maybe like time how long it takes. I don't care about the value. I just care how long it actually took. So what I do sometimes is uh, just leave it like this and just say, I'm just going to leave the function call there, not assign it to anything, and just say, uh, throw the value away. I don't care. Um, sometimes it's actually useful. Uh, and we'll actually encounter maybe uh, why this might not be a good idea if you want to time uh, how long a function takes. So maybe you're trying to do some performance analysis of how long something takes. Um, there are some pitfalls that can happen here. I still have a minute. Um, yeah, so uh, try to assign it to a variable if it's returning something, or print it or whatever. So like if we want to figure out if the input is valid, so instead of putting all the logic in the main function, we can hoist it away to a function where its purpose is just to check if it's valid. So here we're returning a true-false value and just figure out, is val a valid value? So here we're just saying, if it's between the ranges that we want, we're good, we return true, otherwise we return false. And then in, the fun in main, we look and say, we call the function and then just figure out if it's valid. 
So instead of having to do all the logic in the main function, now it's a lot clearer to understand. Any other que any questions? Great, I'll see you on Monday.